And welcome to the 30th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room to ensure that mobile phones are switched off or on silent? And while it's uh, acceptable to use mobile devices for social media within the room, please do not take photographs or record proceedings. The first item on our agenda is the third of our evidence sessions on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill, which proposes uh, to introduce a system of deemed authorisation for organ donation. The session today will focus on evidence from Wales, reviewing the Human Transplantation Wales Act, which came into force in 2015, uh, in order to allow us to explore the act in greater detail and the impact it has had on organ donation rates in Wales. So um, may I welcome to the committee uh, Richard Glendinning, who is uh, now with Ipsos Mori, formerly Director of Social Research and Lead Researcher on the Evaluation of the Welsh Act, uh, uh, Growth for Knowledge UK. Uh, Dr Frank Atherton, Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director of NHS Wales uh, from the Welsh Government, and Dr Katya Empson, uh, Regional Clinical Lead for Organ Donation South Wales, uh, Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. Can I uh, welcome you all uh, today? Thank you very much for attending. It's certainly uh, uh, much appreciated uh, by this committee and we are very keen to learn the lessons uh, of the Welsh experience and uh, experience elsewhere. Um, one of the issues clearly, or the central issue, um, I suspect, for this committee and for the Scottish Government in looking at a change in the law is, will, the, will a change in the law enable an increase in the, the rate of donation? Uh, will it enable an increase in the rate of transplantation? Uh, and I would... Uh, ask the witnesses if they would perhaps like to start by offering an overview of the general uh, perception uh, from the evidence as to whether indeed the bill uh, has met or is beginning to meet uh, its fundamental purposes. Well, shall, I, shall I begin? Well, Please thank do. you very much, Convener, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for inviting us here to give our experience in Wales. It's been a a great pleasure to share our experience which, um, uh, with, with, where, with uh, Scotland and with, indeed with other countries. Uh, it, it, I should emphasise that there is quite a lot of interest you know, in looking at experiences to date. And um, uh, of course, you know, it is still relatively early days in Wales. It's only three years since uh, full implementation of our, uh, of our Act. Uh, and so uh, we're still in learning process around that. Uh, we do generally believe that this has been a positive move. Um, uh, we can talk about the, the, the stats and the, 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 the figures and the donation figures and consent rates, etc. and um, I'm sure we'll get into some of that. But in general terms, we feel that donation rates are going the right way. We still have too many people in Wales and in the UK who are dying while they wait for organ donation. Um, and uh, that, of course, is a tragedy in every individual case. And so we want collectively to, to work on that. I suppose my overarching uh, point would be that uh, the legislation has been really important as a, a part of our process to improve organ donation rates in, in Wales. But it's not the whole story, of course. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a whole range of things which need to, need to happen, and we, we, we know that. We need to get the infrastructure right for organ donation, uh, and we need to get the public engaged. And that really has been part of the, the most important part of our journey, I would say, about how we've used communication during the development of our bill uh, and then the implementa uh, the, the, pro the, 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 the pause between the royal assent and full implementation of the, the, the act uh, and then uh, as, as we've gone forward through implementation. Uh, and so the legislation we believe is a really important part of changing cult cultural attitudes uh, and uh, persuading the public uh, and working with the public uh, so that they believe that organ donation is the right thing to do. Um, so so our, our success is very positive. Um, it's still early days, as I say, uh, but we believe that uh, we have a lot of, in, lot of useful experience to share and we believe that this is the right thing for Wales. It's very interesting, Convener, that... Um, uh, there's, there's very little public dissent now in Wales, I would say. Um, there was a lot of discussion and dialogue when the, 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 the bill was being proposed and the white paper before that, uh, and, and that was a really important process that we went through, just as you are now, of course, going through the process in, in Scotland. 
Um, but really, uh, we don't have a lot of um, uh, ab reaction, I would say, uh, to, uh, to the legislation. There's high levels of understanding and awareness of the legislation, high levels of understanding and awareness of the choices that people now have to make, and uh, I generally positive feel that this has been the right way to go for, for, for Wales. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think the initial evaluation of the impact of the Act suggested uh, that uh, donor rates had not increased while family consent rates had. Now, clearly there have been developments since then, but I wonder if uh, witnesses have a view as to why one of these factors went up faster than the other and, 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 and whether there was any uh, uh, reason for the lag, if you like, in, in the increase in donations. I, I don't think there's any expectation in the first place that there would be an overnight change in this. It's a gradual process as people's knowledge and awareness and support for the change grows. So it's reasonable to expect you'll see change across time. And um, One of the concerns when we did the impact evaluation was a relatively narrow window we had to actually look at data. We only had seven quarters of data and typically in Wales would be about 15 donors a quarter. So it's a very small sample to be looking at. Uh, we extended it as far as we could. There were a lot of positive signs in terms of some of the softer measures around uh, attitudes from the public attitudes from NHS staff, but during the formal evaluation period that we reported on a year ago, there had been no significant change in donor levels. A very small rise over the 21 months before and 21 months afterwards, but a very small change. Uh, in the last 12 months, <coughs> there's been a marked increase. Uh, it looks like the last 12 months will have seen over 80 cases, which is probably the highest figure we've ever had in Wales. So the evidence is that there's a build-up of knowledge and awareness and support and then, if you like, the rise in donor levels will come after time. Okay, very much. Um, gotcha. Add to that that I think there was, uh, in the immediate uh, time period after the implementation of the of the new legislation, there was a lag period where the specialist nurses um, acquired familiarity with the terms of the legislation. So obviously, they understood the act in itself but how they could use that within their conversation when they were approaching families um, and deeming consent. Uh, it took some time for the, for the specialist nurses to become familiar um, and, and confident in using that change in terminolo terminology. There was a real shift in practice from what had previously been a sort of a family and relative-centred approach to uh, one which was more around the presumptive um, facilitation of the, the deceased uh, decision um, and it took some time I think for, for the specialist nurses to acquire the skills uh, around that conversation. That's interesting. Was there any change in the rate of, uh, at which families were approached or was it simply a case of, as you say, uh, a, a, a difference in the way the terminology was used? Um, I don't think there was significant increase. Uh, I think there has been improvements in how uh, the teams are referred patients. So there has been improved recognition uh, outside of uh, immediate transplant, transplant, transplant teams, uh, improved recognition and referral. Uh, so our ability as uh, in intensive care and emergency departments to identify potential donors and refer those patients. Uh, so there has been a degree of increase but the, the substantive, substantial change was around the, the specialist nurse's familiarity with the, the use of the different terminology. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm interested to, to know about the, the numbers of people who have opted in in Wales is at 41%, according to your uh, submission for committee, uh, Dr Atherton. And so that means there's 59 percent of the population that still haven't registered whether they wanted to opt in or opt out so so you deem their consent so I'm interested to know if there's been any anal analysis of the the ones that haven't recorded any wishes to say to I guess to decide on the extent of how we're going to get those people to opt in or opt out um, the, 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 you're right. The, the number, uh, forty-one percent, have chosen to opt in. We, uh, it, and that number has been increased over time, so it's been gradually, uh, gradually rising. So that's uh, that's a positive thing, we believe. 
Uh, the number who opt out, and cause, because people now have an opportunity to opt out, is, uh, has, is about 6% and seems to be stable, and that's, uh, that's good news. Um, younger people tend to, uh, to slightly. Uh, be uh, slightly more, more likely to, to be opting in, um, and, um, uh, but Richard may have some further, further numbers on that. Uh, but what we, we, we never expected to get to, obviously, to 100%. Um, uh, what's really important is that people understand their choices. And so, um, you know, the levels of people we, we survey uh, on a, 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 an annual basis. Uh, so we know that uh, you know, over 70%, uh, 70 to 80% of people now know what their choices are. Uh, so those people who have a, a view and do, do not wish to donate have a clear understanding and an ability to do that and it's very reassuring to us that the, the number stays stable at about six percent uh, opting out I could just add a little bit to that that the um, proportion who have done made no decision one way or the other um, they there is still interesting to see that across the NHS staff research that we've done and with the general public about three quarters or more of people support the idea that no decision implies consent. So there is quite a lot of understanding out there about the implications of not making a formal decision. And we do have, a, as Frank says, 41% who are now opted in within Wales, which I think is the highest figure in the UK. It's continued to rise. Uh, there has not been much of a rise at all in those who've actually opted out. But there's a general understanding across the public that not making a decision does imply consent. I think, I think you're right, other than Scotland, which uh, where we're last... Apologies for that. <laughs> you mentioned young people and uh, has been more likely to opt in. Do you have any concerns that there might be groups that have been missed out that uh, maybe need to be more targeted? I'm curious also to, to know whether the actual NHS staff themselves have been uh, assessed as to whether they are opting in or opting out. A higher level of opting in amongst NHS staff than the general public. So there's definitely a higher figure there. Uh, and there, there is variation in levels of actual positive opting in. Uh, I think actually younger people are a bit less likely to opt in. Um, perhaps it's not an issue that's very high on their radar because of their age. So there are needs to still further uh, communicate and push that point across with people. In this campaign uh, that was uh, launched around the time of the before the implementation, centred around the, the choices that people had, and the three choices that they had were to opt in, opt out, or do nothing, and understand that by doing nothing, their consent would be deemed. Um, so, do nothing was very much presented as an option that people had, and the expectation was that that would be seen on the same level as an opt in. Um, I think in the first year or two after implementation, there was a sort of a feeling that there was a sort of a two-tiered opt-in. So if you opted in on the register, it was a stronger opt-in than somebody who had decided to deem their consent. But that gradually with time, certainly the health care professionals working with that, those families of patients that have, have deemed their consent or to have their consent deemed, see those two levels of consent on the same level and present the information as such to the families that they're working with. Got it. Um, uh, apologies if I misspoke. Uh, it's uh, younger people um, less likely to opt in. Uh, apologies if I gave that misrepresentation. Mis, uh, uh, your, your question, though, uh, about groups that we, w we worry about, um, you know, brings us to the question of ethnic minority groups because uh, we do recognise, and we don't, I don't have uh, figures to hand, but uh, we do recognise that... Um, uh, black, people in black and ethnic minority groups are less likely to make those conscious decisions, less likely to be opting, uh, opting in as donors. And we've done some specific work. Uh, as the communications has, uh, has evolved over time in the three years since implementation, uh, and we've recognised the need to do that. And there was a lot of work before the bill came in to try to understand the views of religious leaders, uh, ethnic minority groups, etc. But that is a group we believe we still need to do more work to target. Thank you very much. Emma? No, I think that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Keith Brown. It may be evident from the evidence given, but it's just a, a factual thing, first of all. If somebody in the well system opts in and subsequent to their death, the family, um, or subsequently the family and the clinicians um, have a different view, can that be overturned? Somebody's conscious decision to opt in can be overturned? 
it, it, it is, yeah, that is a fact. Um, we, we always described it in Wales as a soft uh, opt-out um, process, so um, uh, Katya may well have uh, more information and uh, deals with this on a more regular basis at a, at a personal level, but uh, the policy was always that families would have the opportunity to, uh, to, to make a final decision. Um, uh, bearing in mind the, the wishes of the, uh, uh, the, the deceased uh, relative that, that uh, they hadn't. The good news, we believe, again in Wales, is that although uh, there are occasions where families do overrule the, uh, the, uh, pre either the presumed consent or the opt-in consent uh, that, that people have given before, before they become deceased, um, th th those, uh, those proportions are going down. Uh, one of, again, back to the communications issue, one of the things we've recognised really just more last year is the need for very focused con uh, to, to, to provoke conversations within the family uh, of people's decisions, uh, well, of, of, of the issues, but also of the uh, conscious decisions that people have made. So when people do opt in, we're encouraging them to have those conversations with the family so that the family are aware of the, uh, the, 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 the desire of, of their, their relatives uh, before you know, anything untoward uh, happens. Um, and that's a, a messaging that we're continuing to use now in, in Wales, and that's a, a key stream for the future. But, Katya, you, you obviously deal with... Um, yes, yeah, so there, I think there will always be families that uh, have to make the decision to override uh, the, the decision that their deceased relative had made. Um, and there'll be a number of reasons why people make that choice. Um, for the clinicians and the specialist nurses that are involved... The, the sense is now that we're able to push families harder in what can be a very difficult time. Well, we, what is obviously a very difficult time for the family, but because of the, the change in the legislation, perhaps we're empowered to have more presumptive conversations with families um, and then to sort of push and challenge families and to really try and ensure that they do facilitate the decision that their loved one made in, in their life. Um, I think it is key to ensure that the public is educated to have conversations with their family, uh, to make sure that their wishes are known, much as they might choose to make known whether they want to be cremated or buried after they've died, but just in the same way as they make decisions about other aspects of what would happen to them after they die, that they make those choices clear to their families. Um, but it, I think it would be impossible to work with a legislation that somehow enforced the decision to be pushed through irrespective of what the, the family's position was in that situation because ultimately the specialist nurses and the clinicians that are working with that family would not want to harm that family um, in the sense that uh, they would push through donation if it was clearly something that the family felt very much that they couldn't support. Um, and you need to have the support of the family uh, in order to be able to proceed to donation safely. So you need to be able to ask the family questions about the, the, uh, the health um, and the, the, some of the social aspects of the potential donor's uh, life uh, in order that, that transplant can proceed safely. So to try and, to try and make that happen without the family being positive and uh, on board about the process would be almost impossible, I think. This is the point about the conversation. Uh, this is a key part of the process. And it's less difficult for the specialist nurses to have the conversation in the knowledge that more people have been talking about the issue. So in the latest research, I think 55% of people said that at some point they had a conversation about organ donation with family members. But that still leaves a lot of people who haven't had the conversation. And some of those conversations won't be necessarily very contemporary. So there's still a need to promote that um, conversation because it does make the conversation in due course less difficult. It's a hugely challenging set of circumstances for sure, but it becomes slightly more straightforward in the context that the conversation may have taken place within that family and that the wider family were aware of the wishes of the individual. Factual answer to if I can ask one very quick question for a factual answer before the substantive question, which was would the reverse work if somebody had opted out? Can that be overturned by the family and clinicians? It can in practice if the family can provide evidence um, that the that the person had made made the change in their decision. Uh, so, for instance, a family uh, might 
present evidence that, well, he did decide that uh, a few years ago when the legislation changed. Uh, but the other night we were uh, talking to a family whose son was waiting for a kidney um, and he said quite clearly then, well, actually, on balance, I wouldn't have a problem with that, that proceeding. So we, are ask, we would ask families to provide sort of evidence around what sort of conversation they, were, they had had uh, to support that change in decision, but potentially that could happen. It is the last known wish of the person that you are you are working with. So the decision that they've recorded on the ODR might not be the last known wish. And the substantive point really was, my concern is where the rights of the donor come in all this and it seems they come behind a number of other groups, essentially, uh, when that person takes a decision as to whether to opt in or opt out or do nothing. If it's the case that whether it's opt in or opt out, that their own decision taken in full possession of the facts is overturnable, whatever it is. Why was that, um, during the passage of the Welsh legislation, why was that decided not to put that on the face of the bill, except in the circumstance you just mentioned where additional information can be offered, but it wasn't put on the bill, it wasn't made, as far as I can tell, maybe it wasn't a communication strategy. Why was it not made plain to donors that really their expressed view, either opt in or opt out, can be overturned? as a reason for not putting the family veto, if you like, on the face of the bill? Um, well, we may need to go back to, to look at the bill, um, because, but, but, but I believe it was clear on the bill that this was a soft opt-out process, by which we mean that... The, the, which, it, which entirely means that it, it is overturnable. Um, so, uh, we, we, you know, you may, we, we, we and you may need to kind of look at what was actually on the face of the bill. And my... my Belief is that that was pretty clear. The evidence in Scotland is that the convention is clear, but it's not in the face of the bill. And I guess the question is simply, is that right? And is that the Welsh model as well? Which we, we deduce it is, but uh, clearly any, anything further you would wish to come back to us with on that would be, would be very welcome. Uh, Alec O'Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I'd like to explore the issues around why families override. And we had a very illuminating meeting with specialist nurses who took us through a role play of the conversations that happen um, either prior to death or just after death, um, where a, a patient is in a, a situation where their organs will be viable. And they made it very clear that one of the barriers in Scotland is the sheer number of questions that are asked of families at that time. And the, there is, it, it struck me that there may be a, a bureaucratic impediment to um, this, this sort of successful discussion with families at, at time of death. And actually, you know, they are clearly experiencing one of the worst days of their life. They may have to answer several hundred questions in some cases and I just wondered if you could explain to us what happens in Wales around that and whether it is as bureaucratic as we have it in Scotland and if you've found any workarounds or shortcuts. I'm, I th I'm not sure it's bureaucratic as such I think there are a number of questions that will be asked of families and that is in order that the donation can proceed in a safe manner so you do need to ask uh, quite deep um, questions of the family about their social history and about the patient's uh, health um, in order to be able to ensure that transplant goes ahead safely and if the family are unable to support those questions then it would be difficult to proceed with donation um, I don't think they're presented in a bureaucratic way because ultimately the specialist nurses are very well uh, trained and experienced and able to manage families in this situation very sensitively and compassionately. Uh, so I like to think that that conversation doesn't present itself as a, a sort of a tick box and a... Um, you know, a shopping list, as it were. Um, but perhaps that's the way it might look if you were to simply review the forms that the specialist use, nurses use. But that conversation would take place in a compassionate way. I think some families will look for more information uh, from the specialist nurses about how the donation process goes. Uh, so might then be presented with further information by the specialist nurses about the processes pre-death uh, or after death. Um, and other families will want less information, uh, 
because they they simply don't really want to know when they're happy to let let the process run its course. Uh, so the specialist nurses are able to share information as and when it's needed. But there are a series of questions that needs to need to be addressed and answered in order that donation can take place safely. I that. And I, I should say that the, the specialist nurses that we met um, had a wonderful manner about them. And they actually turned those questions into almost a, a conversation about the life of the person who just passed away. And it was actually quite a cathartic experience, I think, for, well, certainly in the role play we experienced. Um, I just wonder if uh, it, two of your colleagues, your, your two colleagues would have a view on that and whether we could be doing things sim in a more simple uh, manner. Really, all I can do is echo what Katia said. You know, we 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 don't. Uh, uh, you know, the last thing we need is to have layers of bureaucracy when people are going through these very difficult circumstances. Um, but there are safeguards that need to be put in place, information that has to be gathered, and uh, um, what you just described, I think, is the way to go about it. And that's not about legislation; that's about you know policy and practice, really. Mm. I have nothing particularly to add to that point other than um, specialist nurses continuing to need support and guidance about best practice. That evolves over time, so it's a continuous process of updating knowledge. So a very short supplementary to that before I move on to a different area. I think uh, what I'm driving at here is, for me, one of the most jarring moments of that role play was when they started asking about very intimate aspects of lifestyle and particular risky behaviour. And it strikes me that actually families may not know about risky behaviour. And so it's a, it's a subjective viewpoint. It's like, well, I know, you know, I, I have absolutely every faith they never in, engaged in that kind of practice. But that's not... Uh, a surety there's no guarantees there and obviously we'll be testing blood and uh, and tissue for um, evidence of contamination or, or disease um, so do we really need to be asking those very sensitive questions if actually we're going to be using very strong clinical measures to to check um, I, I think it's it's set out in our code of practice that the expectation is that you will explore those themes with families and that our experience in that over the last few years has suggested that it is necessary um, to, to ask those questions of families. I, um, I don't think it's, I, I can only, I, I don't know the evidence behind it or, or what work has been done to try and uh, prevent those questions needing to be asked but it's my understanding that they're an essential part of of the process of safe donation and transplantation taking place okay that's absolutely fair enough um just second area is about mental health support and uh, starting with families because we're, we're talking about families what um, mental health support is offered to families both in in that initial sort of 24 hours around the discussion about organ donation and in the weeks and months following um the the decision to donate or, the, or moving forward to the donation so i think it's important to understand that the uh, the process of uh kind of consenting or authorizing for organ donation is a normal part of end of life care uh, and that it doesn't require any particular special support in terms of mental health or sort of psychological support for those families. In many ways, the evidence suggests that families who've gone through the process of donation uh, get enormous benefit from it, um, and it's a very positive outcome for families at an otherwise very bleak time. Um, I don't think that any particular psychological support is required for those families over and above what should be offered as part of standard end-of-life care and bereavement care for families going through the, the process of, of a loved one dying. Okay, that's very helpful. And final question, if I may, Convener, and this is actually perhaps more prescient. Um, we met with uh, organ recipients last week. It was a very powerful uh, meeting. And um, one of the things that we were very struck by was the absence of mental health support in Scotland for people on the transport list. And that is, and they described it themselves as a roller coaster that you might get several calls in the middle of the night to be ready for transplant only to have uh, that, you know, find yourself stood down as it were, um, for whatever reason. And that can be tremendously hard, uh, particularly for people who are very ill to begin with. Um, what support in Wales is offered to those who are on uh, recipient transplant lists? Because I don't really work on the 
on the recipient side as such I'm very much on the on the other side of, of the process um, but I think it is clear that there is a psychological problem or psychological difficulties for patients in that state they're um, they're facing uh, kind of chronic illness um, and this uh, uncertainty about their their own prognosis in the face of waiting for an organ uh, but also at the point where they do receive the organ uh, the knowledge that that organ has come from somebody who's deceased um, is in itself um, a psychological problem um, and that some support I'm sure is required from them but but quite what we offer in Wales I'm not I'm not sure uh, likewise I, I can't give you a, a direct answer at the moment but um, I, I recognize the the dilemma and the problem for people that you mentioned uh, and uh, what I'll do is when we get back to Wales we'll just uh, check with service providers I don't believe that there's any specific mental aspect of mental health that's uh, uh, that's dedicated to this but if there is we'll let the the committee know would be helpful thank you appreciate it uh, Sandra White just a very small supplementary please uh, having you know, listened to evidence and also met with families, as Alex Cole Hamilton had mentioned, the one thing that came through positively all the time was they felt it was a gift rather than be deemed consent. I wonder, did you get the same in Wales <clears throat> when you were talking to the people? They seemed to think it was a gift, or that's what they said, rather than the state interfering type thing. It was it was much discussed in the pro, in the consultation period leading up to changing our legislation that the concern that we were somehow remove, removing the altruistic gift that donors were offering at the point of death by making legislative change around it, um, and it was much discussed and there was concern around it. It is hasn't been borne out uh, since we um, have implemented the 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 the, uh, the legislation change. There hasn't been a sense that people no longer see it as a gift. It is some, still seen and very much valued uh, by, um, by the general public, by people involved directly and closely with that process as, as a wonderful gift. And I think key to that is celebrating the life of the donor um, with uh, such things as the St John's Awards um, and other kind of softer things outside of legislative change which really celebrate and, and ensure that positivity is maintained and, um, and, and sustained. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. I, I a small supplementary going back to the questions from Keith Brown on family uh, override. Uh, and, and you mentioned that there were still uh, circumstances where somebody was either deemed consent or had positively opted in, but that the family might take a different view. Is there any difference uh, between those two categories though, uh, in, in, in the rate of that, or is, are they both so small as to be statistically insignificant? It's the first part now. So the, first, the point being the group of people who have positively opted in versus the group of people who are deemed consent, is there any difference in the evidence on family override of, of those wishes, express or otherwise? So I think what is difficult to interpret from the raw data, if you like, is in the immediate period after the implementation, I'm not sure we were very good at recording where people were on that spectrum. Uh, so when you were uh, overriding perhaps a deemed consent, it isn't really clear from the way we collected the data and recorded information whether that override was because actually it was an expressed wish verbally with the family or whether it was a, a, a clear override of a known decision um, if you see what I mean so so I don't think we really had that glan granularity of the information at that immediate time after the implementation phase I think we're better at recording it now because we've understood better those different groups um, so that information is better cap captured now um, and certainly in all groups we've seen a reduction in overrides uh, so we've, re we've seen a reduction in known uh, expressed wish and a reduction in deemed consent overrides. Um, but it's, it's really quite difficult to tease out the information. We're also talking very, very small numbers, so it's difficult to draw any true conclusions from it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions around consent rates. Uh, the submission um, from Dr Atherton highlights consent rates um, in Wales have increased and are now significantly higher than England. Um, so I wanted to know uh, from the panel, what do you attribute that to? Has it been 
um, this a national conversation, obviously, which has taken place in Wales. Um, and do you think this can actually be, be maintained uh, now that legislation is passed um, and you know it's out of people's minds, maybe in Wales? Well, I'll start off. Richard may wish to come in on some of the figures, but um, uh, we, we we do see consent rates, uh, you know, increasing, um, and. Um, that's that that is one of the positive things that we, we we've recognized as one of the markers of, of the program really um your question was about whether uh, there's anything sp you know what part does the legislation play in that versus what part does the communication play in that has been a, an issue that we've been trying to disentangle and you can't fully disentangle them because these uh, are, are very interrelated uh, but but it, but we do believe that the the, the ongoing communication uh, process is is required, and what we see is in some of the the things that we measure, we do see a kind of dropping off when communication dips, and so we recognise that we need to both continue uh, communication on an annual basis and also to tailor that education towards specific issues. So we we talked earlier about the the issue of uh, having family conversations, for example. Um, so. Um, so, so, so we do think that uh, the, 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 the rates are increasing or improving, um, and uh, and that is a consequence of both the legislation and our communication processes. Yeah. Both to, just to uh, echo Frank's point there, that the um, percentage has gradually risen, and at forty one percent, it's been just creeping up year by year over a period of time. But the nature of the Welsh system and the quite widespread recognition that no decision uh, implies consent may cap that figure so it's not going to go necessarily surging ahead it may well continue to rise because it's a gradual build-up of awareness and knowledge okay thank you and in terms of um, age of consent um, the bill which we're uh, looking at proposes a deemed authorization would apply to those um, aged over 16 in Scotland now obviously in Wales it's 18 and I just wondered uh, from the witnesses um, why was the age of 18 chosen in Wales chosen because that's in line with the Mental Capacity Act in Wales, um, but you might want to ask the lawyers. But that was my understanding, was that it would keep it in line with other legislation in Wales. Um, yeah. yeah. It was to do with, uh, to do with, um, with that and with our general uh, definitions around, you know, in, in a range of legislation around what is, you know, at what point do people be classified as an adult and uh, uh, able to make mental... mental uh, have sufficient mental capacity to make make decisions of their own and given that if this bill passes and the scottish age of consent is 16 there's no specific issues um around nhs wales accepting uh, organs from a 16 year old from scotland as far as you know i can't imagine that there would be that we would um just much as in scotland i'm sure europe would be receiving organs from people who have had their consent deemed uh, it wouldn't be an issue to to uh, deploy the the act uh, to receive organs from other nations. I mean, our approach in Wales has always been that the, any organs go into the general pool for, for UK-wide basis, and, and that would apply to Scotland as it would apply to Wales, we would, we would expect. Thank you very much. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you, David. You know, some of the responses to the committee have highlighted the need for adequate efforts to inform the public about opting out. Um, what avenues are available to people to opt out in Wales? Um, so people can opt out on the website and you can opt out uh, through your driving licence still. Um, uh, but people are encouraged to go and opt out by the, uh, the website uh, that uh, the NHS, uh, that the Welsh Government sort of uh, publicise um, and have links to um, whenever they send out their public information. We, we, we did explore the use, in addition to the, 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 the routes that Katya mentions, we did explore uh, whether it would be possible to do it through primary care records. Um, that became quite problematic in Wales, and in fact we didn't go down that route. And the reason was that um, th there's often a delay between, um, between uh, somebody making a decision through primary care, perhaps a paper-based system because we haven't got our electronic systems quite as, uh, as rapid as they should be, and, um, and things then getting onto the register. Uh, and it was seen that there might be a, a circumstance wherein somebody could have made, uh, you know, should have primary care an election, 
uh, say an opt-out election, but that wasn't recorded uh, and, um, uh, in that small window. If somebody was to become deceased, it would be a contrary to their wishes. So, so, so we, we we looked at that and we discounted it and we, we tended to use the uh, the routes that Katia has mentioned. Difficult to reach groups, um, like a percentage of population are difficult to read and write in a deaf community. How did you manage to communicate with them? So sitting with the Welsh Transplant Advisory Group, there was um, uh, an advisor for the ethnic uh, minorities and for disability um, and disabled groups. Our specialist nurses also did, certainly in Cardiff, um, a number of sort of reach out sessions to uh, dis disability groups uh, to try and raise, raise awareness in those groups um, and worked with other kind of faith leaders as well. So, so it both came from uh, work that the Welsh Government did but also from within the health care professionals such as the specialist nurses doing sort of reach out work into communities as well. That work to, to try and understand the needs of special groups and people with disabilities of, of whatever nature uh, did translate into the communications materials that we then produce. So everything was produced in Braille in a number of languages, in large font, etc. So, so we did taper the, tailor the information and the communication to the needs of the, of the community. Very important. Yeah. Um, Brian Hook. Good morning to the panel. Thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence uh, today. Now we you've gone to an, an opt-out system, uh, and we have you've retained an opt-in system. And failing those two uh, options uh, uh, being taken, we're going to deemed consent. I just wondered where you thought the, the public understanding in Wales is of, of the, the potential decisions uh, that they can make, where that stands at the moment. Issues that we we do look at very regularly, um, and again, it's it's something that we've seen the the figures rise year on year. Um, I haven't got the latest figure in my head, but it's it's around seventy to eighty percent now of people who understand what their options are. Um, we do we we did see one year when that dipped slightly, uh, and we recognise the, the the need to intensify our communications around that and to remind people of their options. So it's not something you can do and forget it's not a one-off thing it's something that you have to continually keep drip feeding as part of your communications message uh, but we do feel we have we have very high and uh, now back on sustainable levels of public understanding of those three options okay if i could uh, convene a, i think uh, dr Emerson, you, you touched on this but if if we um if the communication is at a level and the, and the marketing point of a better expression uh, it's at a high level and we give every option possible to those uh, who wish to opt out and make that 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 uh, decision uh, as accessible as possible why retain opt-in because uh, for my uh, if the communication is particularly good and we and you deliver you deliver that level of understanding why retain the opt-in because i think that, that what we're trying to explore here is, is an opt-in is a decision an opt-out is a decision deemed consent in those circumstances is potentially a non-decision and, and easier to override. So why retain the opt-in? <laughs> it's not something that I'd, I'd given thought to. I, I suspect it par it, in part it'll perhaps be historical because in the UK we've always had the organ donor register. So there's always been this opportunity to opt in. Uh, since transplant became an option uh, and donation became an option. Uh, so it might in part be historical, but I think it should. It also encourages people to consider the, the opportunity that it is. Um, we know statistically that most people, when asked, want to be uh, donors, um, but less people actually take the action of registering. Um, but I think by maintaining the opt-in register, you allow people to say very definitely and clearly, in the event of my death, I want to donate my, my, my organs. Um, and it will take some significant time and, and an awful lot of education, I think, for the public to, to, to see that on the, on, to see that on the same level as not registering their 
Um, I'm trying. I'm losing myself a little bit, but the, the, because we've always had that register, and there has always been that that opportunity to to register your wish to be a donor, to lose mm. that facility for people to make that positive choice, I think would go against um, the the positivity around organ donation. For it only to be an option to opt out would would be a step backwards i think um for 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 the the, the public of scotland um so there, 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 well i mean there is something about alignment with the register so we have a uk register and we need to uh, uh you know we, we need to be mindful that other countries ha you know ha have different policies at the moment different practices and so we need to align with the register but but the uh, other fundamental point that we touched on earlier was the one about Having an opt-in, a conscious decision, is something which is really important to help to provoke those conversations within families because we need to have those conversations, whether it's deemed consent or opt-in consent, to, to, um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 imp to prevent that issue that we talked about earlier of families kind of overriding decisions. So a conscious decision that's discussed in a family would seem to us to be the best, the best option uh, because it would provoke those discussions and lead to higher organ donation rates. So, sorry, sorry to, to, it, it, obviously what we're looking for here is to try and increase organ donation as much as we possibly can. That's the outcome that, that we're all looking for. But what, well, I think what I'm pushing out here is if we give the maximum opportunity for people to opt out, I'm just wondering with the conversation with the family to say, you know, your loved one had the, this opportunity to opt out and the decision was to remain uh, within deemed consent. Would that not, would that not be considered consider as a positive decision? I think my concern with that approach is that you're only allowing people to make a negative choice. Um, that that, 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 in, that in that situation, the, the education campaign, the publicity campaign, campaign that you would have to launch into would all be just around making a choice not to, not to donate and register your wish not to be a donor. Um, and, and that negativity... And the publicity with the negativity there might might go against uh, the 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 popula popularity of organ donation as such. If you sort of mean that, it would mean that people would be would perhaps just take away the message that 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 actually they should register that they don't want to be a donor. That that, that you might lose something in your messaging to the public. Um. Richard, do you have anything to add in these in these areas from a communication perspective? That's that's absolutely fine. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you again. I'm interested in issues around deemed consent and people who might have uh, an incapacity or th they don't have the ability to maybe understand what deemed authorisation means. The bill includes safeguards that uh, so that authorisation for donation can be deemed for or cannot be deemed for certain categories of people with incapacity. And it talks about people who have over a significant period lack the capacity to understand deemed authorisation. So do you think the, the, the bill um, presents enough information so that people who don't have capacity uh, won't just be deemed to provide consent where they haven't had the ability to maybe understand? And what do you do in Wales, for instance, with that? I think the, uh, the legislation does protect that that group of people um, and the code of practice um, really puts it in the area for the specialist nurses to explore. Um, so of course people who lack capacity can still donate uh, through the process of um, the, the same as we had before the legislation whereby their, their thoughts around donation um, and how they felt about donation could be explored with the family and you would go down the road of allowing them go down to the route of allowing them to become donors through their sort of expressed wish um, but the consent wouldn't be deemed um, in the same way as somebody who had capacity in their lifetime and and the, the the work around that and the conversation around that takes place by the specialist nurses uh, operationally at the time In our uh, papers, it 
talks about the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance said that the provisions in the Scottish Bill need to be strengthened um, because uh, to support adults with incapacity. And it, it talks about because the word significant period of incapacity. So does that need to be more prescriptive because significant period means what? A month, a week, six months? Should that be more stronger? It, it is. It isn't clear. There isn't a specific time period in our con, in our legislation. Um, the there would be advantages and disadvantages potentially on, on in both ways that it would become a, that you would have a sort of a cut off where somebody suddenly lacks capacity. And I think it is safer in some ways to allow the healthcare professionals involved with that patient to sort of understand what uh, that who that person was and when and how long they didn't have capacity for um, and and make a decision as healthcare professionals there. So to have it in the code of practice that it's the duty of the healthcare professionals to explore whether the patient had capacity uh, to deem consent um, and the timing and the length of time the, the, uh, around when they didn't have capacity, I, I think it is... I, I can't see an advantage to having a specific cut-off because you might then have a, a patient who lack capacity for just a few days more than that uh, where it wouldn't sit quite right. So I think it is best to leave it to the judgment of the healthcare professionals involved at the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Sandra Park. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. And thank you for coming along. I wanted to uh, ask you some questions about the pre-death procedures. Um, Obviously, the Scottish proposal, the proposal from the Scottish Government is slightly different from the proposal that's put forward uh, by the Welsh Government because you are looking at, under the Human Tissue Act 2004, and our proposal is that there be more clarity and there will be guidelines in regards to any procedures uh, for pre-death. Pre I just wondered if you could clarify or give us a wee bit more information about what happens in, in Wales, uh, particularly under deemed consent even. For, for pre death procedures? So, in terms of pre death procedures, um, we the, the, the things that it's accepted uh, that can be done to a potential donor pre death uh, in order to facilitate them becoming a, a donor um, are kind of. Um, agreed at uh, a, a more UK-wide level with the uh, work that was done by UK Donation Ethics Committee. Um, so there's accepted practices um, um, and work that it's, uh, and things that it's acceptable to, to do to support donors pre-death in order to facilitate their ability to become a donor. Um, I don't think that we approach families and ask families specifically for consent for all of those different types of uh, procedures um, unless families seem to be particularly looking for information and want to understand it in greater detail. I think it's something that is uh, accepted practice by the healthcare professionals uh, looking after the, the potential donor at the time um, and that we understand that the family might not in all circumstances wish to know the the finer more slightly difficult details around around the medical actions that are taking place with the fam uh, to the donor uh, thank you Kivina. it certainly <coughs> it seems very different from what we've heard from from families who have donated we heard from uh, you know a, a person uh, basically who went through this but was actually talked through and was able if they were so wished to see some of the procedures now, you said earlier on in your conversation about, um, you know, people's consent and people understanding. Uh, from your answer there, people don't seem to understand that the pre-death procedures actually go ahead uh, under the Human Tissue Act 2004, where a body can be kept alive for, for the organs, uh, apparently. And under deemed consent, I just wonder, do you agree that uh, under deemed consent that the same process can go ahead, as you explained in Wales. I think families do, do understand, and families are very much involved in the process. I think what I'm getting at is we wouldn't want to sit in a room with a family and say, 
Do you agree to this blood test and this blood test and this blood test and this blood test? Do you agree to us starting this infusion and that treatment and we're going to give some steroids and start this type of treatment? I think it's the specifics around that that are necessary perhaps to go through with the family. But the family would be very much involved um, and um, have the opportunity to observe things such as the uh, the the uh, kind of certifying death by neurological criteria to watch br the brainstem death test taking place, we would support and encourage that if it seemed that the family were were, were wanting to, to, to have that kind of that level of involvement and not all families choose that, but those that do, we would support that. I think it would just be important that it doesn't become, um, you don't have to consent to every specific activity that, that you might need to undertake to the potential donor? <clears throat> Basically, under the deemed consent, then obviously if it's been opt out, you haven't signed anything and it's uh, deemed consent, um, you support uh, this type of, you know... Yeah, PDF. I would say that deemed consent would be the same as expressed consent um, and uh, people that had opted in on that level in terms of... the. The, the, the problem is, of course, when people are signing on to the organ donation register, I, I'm afraid it's people are uninformed really about the process that will be the taking place, that that is something that most people, unless you work in an intensive care environment or an emergency department type environment, you're going to be unfamiliar with the process of how somebody goes through becoming a donor. And trying to share that sort of information in a publicity campaign will will probably not be in the interests of the of the vast majority of the public who simply won't won't want to to really understand that at that level of detail. Um, so at the time then that the potential donor is going down that route, families will be given that information um, and shared that information with them. Um, as is appropriate in a kind of a sensitive and compassionate way and given the opportunity to observe um, under and understand. But you wouldn't want to put the family through the process of a kind of a tick box for every single investigation or test or additional infusion that you might start as part of that process. In, in legislative terms, we, um, in, in, in Wales... Uh, um, this was looked at when the, uh, the, the, the bill was being discussed uh, in the Assembly. And the conclusion we reached was that Section 43 of, of the Human Tissue Act of 2004, so we, we chose to replicate the wording in, uh, that, that was in, in the, the HTA Act. Um, now, I, as I understand it, and I'm not a specialist, but obviously you, you, your Scottish Human Tissue uh, Act is, is, is slightly different, so I, I, that will obviously need to be carefully looked at. But we chose to align very closely the um, uh, the, uh, the the two pieces of legislation, so so that um, yeah, that may help. Thank you. I know it's a difficult uh, sorry, to, it's a very difficult subject to broach, but it was something that had been raised, and I've kept an interest in how it works in other areas. So obviously, we're proposing slightly different. Uh, where there'll be a wee bit more information and guidelines uh, through that. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, can I just, in conclusion, uh, refer to Frank Atherton's uh, very helpful evidence in which you compare the Welsh legislation, the Scottish legislation, and draw conclusions about the effectiveness of the Welsh legislation to date. Having provided answers to the questions committee members have, is there anything in addition that either... Frank Atherton or, or the other witnesses feel we should bear in mind uh, as we come to uh, uh, the, the next uh, stage in this process. Just to, to thank uh, the committee, um, you know, this is a journey which we're all on in the UK, and it's it's good that it's a shared journey. This is one of the many many experiences where you know I believe we can learn and share across different countries. So, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, good luck with your deliberations. Thank you very much. I have a late bid for a, a, a supplementary from Keith Brown. Back up with the casino convener says, thanks very much for your evidence. Uh, just one thing, though, the response that you gave previously, Dr Atherton, to Miles Briggs about the 16-year-old situation, I know that was probably not something you anticipated. Just to see if it's possible, when you do come back to the committee with some written uh, evidence, I mean, just 
the idea that a country which has passed a law which says you must be 18 to have a, an organ donated would then accept ones from 16-year-olds kind of jars a little bit. Just if there's any, uh, you know, a basis for that, you could provide back uh, and also be really useful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Can I thank the witnesses uh, for, for your very comprehensive evidence and look forward to hearing from you a little further uh, on the basis of our conversations. Thank you very much. We'll now uh, suspend briefly um, and we will resume in, a, in, in two or three minutes uh, with one further item in public. Resume with agenda item two, which is an opportunity for the committee to consider five further proposals by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, in relation to a number of UK statutory instrument proposals. These are the EU uh, exit regulations relating to food and feed imports, materials and articles in contact with food, the sprouts and seeds regulations, the animal feed amendment regulations, and the food additives, flavourings, enzymes, and extraction solvents uh, regulations. Now, a private paper has been circulated to colleagues, which you will have seen, uh, and which highlights a range of issues and points of clarification that we may wish to seek uh, written answers to uh, from the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing. Uh, who has already been to see us in relation to other regulations. Uh, I'm, I hope members have had the opportunity to look at these, but they will see uh, the, 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 the essence of them are to obtain clarification on a number of areas. Uh, and I wonder if colleagues have any comments on those suggested uh, further questions we may wish to put to the <coughs> Scottish Government. Sandra White. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I mean, read through the papers and thank you so much for providing them. Uh, there's lots of issues that I want to raise, but I'll stick with one at the moment, which, as the paper says as well, is a recurring theme. It's the cost. Uh, basically, who's going to bear this cost? Is it going to be the public purse, Scottish Government, local authorities appear to be 
having to find some costs. So I would be interested in, in finding out a wee bit more about that. It seems to be four or five of the issues does come back to it's going to, it's going to cost, but we don't know how much. I think, I think that's that's fair. And, and uh, the advice we've had from SPICE and the legal department does say that we should go back, suggest that we go back on cost. Your point about local authorities is a fair one, and it may be worth adding that uh, to, just to confirm whether or not there are costs for local authorities in addition to those for... I think there will be, but it would be good to yeah, have clarification in, in, Indeed, I think we should inquire on that. Keith Brown. Just to say, convener, in relation to the letter that you received from the Minister, paragraph 12345, um, and I've made this point before, and it's really just to put it on the public record, that it's asking, or it's saying that the Scottish Government has not yet had sight of the final SIs, and they are not available in the public domain at this stage. And this committee is being asked, albeit that I think we're likely to ask for more information anyway, but we've been asked to approve this as part of a legislative process. The jeopardy in that, I think, should be pretty obvious to us all, trying to agree something without having seen it, when it can go off in different directions, when there are competing views on whether it's category A or category B, I think is um, a difficult to... Um, a situation, but um, in general terms, can I just say that I think the questions which are raised in the briefing, I have no objection to those being asked of the Scottish Government. I think there's one or two of them. I was probably less concerned about costs, at least those that fall on the Scottish Government, because to me it's part of the nature of government, but I've got no problem with the questions which the clerks have raised been asked. Thank you very much, and certainly that general point about uh, uh, in, in seeking that the Minister confirms uh, that we get that clarification or certainty around the, the final content of the SIs, I think, is, is something that we can accommodate within those the terms of those points. Uh, Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convina. Just to put on record, uh, I intimated to the committee previously that um, I and my party will be dissenting from um, all such regulations um, that come before us just on two, for two principal reasons. Firstly, for the level of power they confer on ministers without due scrutiny of parliament, and in terms of uh, my party's general resistance to all aspects of the EU withdrawal process. Thank you very much. That's noted. Uh, clearly, we're not at the point on these regulations. If members are agreed to seek further information, we're not at the point on this set of coming to a final conclusion. Uh, but that point is certainly noted with reference to these and uh, to others. Uh, can I say thank you to colleagues? I think there seems to be general agreement we should seek the further information that has been described. Uh, and we will therefore uh, move on in a moment to agenda item three, uh, which will be in private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>